instead contradicts Marxist theories and invites readers to draw fatalistic conclusions about how to overcome capitalism. If that is the case, then Grossman created one more hurdle in thought that revolutionary masses have to overcome in order to release their own power and creativity. It is our duty then to critique it. In my personal opinion, Kleiman's articles should have been devastating to Grossman's breakdown model, but they apparently uh, uh, were not devastated. His, his followers are not devastated uh, because his writings have been met by deafening silence and no one wants to come forward and debate about it. So we are sponsoring these classes in order to break the embargo against considering Kleiman's <clears throat> analysis. Much of the so-called left disparages Marxist humanism with name calling, not debate. MHI, on the contrary, believes in the widest possible discussion and debate about Marxism, not for scholastic reasons, but as the way to keep Marx alive and to develop Marxism for the 21st century and to provide theoretical resources to workers and other mass movements. Kleiman is Professor Emeritus of Economics at Pace University in New York and the author of Reclaiming Marx's Capital, A Refutation of the Myth of Inconsistency, and his other book, The Failure of Capitalist Production, Underlying Causes of the Great Recession. He's written dozens of journal articles uh, and other peer review publications, and he writes often for MHI's online publication. <laughs> so uh, welcome and thank you for the series, Andrew. Thank you very much, Anne, for that, um, I think, really important uh, introduction, uh, clarification, explanation of, of, of why we're doing this. Uh, before I start, just a couple of notes about things that were uh, talked about last time. Uh, Alan uh, Freeman and I got into some discussion of the context of Marx's discussion of worsening economic crises. Um, the only full-scale discussion of that that I'm aware of by Marx is in Volume 1 of Capital, uh, Section 3 of Chapter 25. Uh, so you can look at that and, and see uh, what he says about the worsening of economic crises. The other thing is that um, I kind of spitball a response to Teresa Henry, and I got it wrong. And so I'm sorry for getting it wrong. Okay. The fact is that business services are part of what are called intermediate inputs, national accounts. That's the used up constant capital. So the C, the used up constant capital, actually does represent about 50 to 55 percent of the total price of output in the U.S. for the last uh, 75 years. Um, okay, so what I want to do uh, first today is to look at the Bauer-Grossman reproduction scheme. Uh, again, uh, if you have questions about my presentation, what I've just said, uh, put them in the chat right away. Don't wait till the second hour. And uh, I'll, from time to time, look at the chat and see if there's uh, something I can answer uh, on on the spot, more or less. Uh, we've got uh, Alan Freeman's going to be, and we've got uh, Sebastian uh, Hernandez. We should be getting Nick Potts, uh, but as a noted temporalist, uh, Nick is not on time. Um, but humorously, uh, right. So we're going to be first looking at the. Um, assumptions of the Bauer-Grossman reproduction scheme, uh, then do a little bit of math so we can understand the implications, the properties uh, of the scheme. 
Okay, so as we talked about last time, Bauer said that his reproduction scheme shows that the system doesn't break down. Grossman said, no, it shows that it breaks down. What's responsible for the difference? Bauer was not trying to model long-run growth. Uh, he was showing that the whole product can be sold internally in a capitalist economy without foreign trade, ongoing uh, accumulation, expanded reproduction. So he just considered four years, given his purposes, uh, that was more than enough, four years. But Grossman was focused on long-run tendencies. So he kept calculating through 35 years or so, and he found that, you know, eventually the scheme does break down. Okay, so Bauer's scheme was Grossman's first approximation to his own theory, which he then modified in the last chapter of uh, his book. So first, let's talk about the assumptions uh, that the scheme is based on. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Share. Share and share alike. Okay. Um, okay. Can everybody see that? Can people see my screen? Okay, you can see my you can see my screen. Okay, so uh, uh, let me just say that Marx's scheme of expanded reproduction in Volume Two of Capital, like Bauer's, it was not designed as a model of long run economic growth. Uh, it did show that the whole product can be sold within a closed economy, but the stated purpose of Marx's scheme was to show that Adam Smith and Ricardo and others were wrong when they claimed that accumulation of constant capital trickles down uh, so that all additional constant capital investment ultimately becomes additional variable capital, boosts employment or wages and benefits or some combination, okay? So in most respects, Bauer's scheme is just like Marx's scheme. Uh, there were two departments, means of production, uh, producers, consumption good producers. Uh, there's no foreign trade. There's no borrowing or saving. Uh, there's no reserve stocks, inventories to draw on. So everything you use has got to be newly produced each year. Uh, the rate of surplus value, uh, S over V, rate of exploitation is held constant. There's capital accumulation. There's economic growth. And then we'll come back to the, the, the last bit. Um, Okay, there were a couple of differences between the schemes. Uh, first, Marx's includes fixed capital, means of production uh, that don't fully pass, uh, their value doesn't fully pass into the value of the product. There's no fixed capital in um, Bauer's scheme. All of the constant capital circulates annually. Uh, the other difference is that Marx abstracted from technical change. Methods of production in Marx's scheme were not changing because he wasn't concerned about that. So as a result, in Marx's scheme of expanded reproduction, the compositions of capital, the ratio of means of production to workers physically, and the ratio of constant to variable capital in terms of value, they both remain constant. Uh, and because there was no technological improvement, the values or prices of commodities also remain constant. So I've got a nice green arrow and smiley face because that works out really nice. No technical change. Technical change causes values and prices to change. You don't have the technical change. You can assume that the values or prices are constant. 
Okay, but Bauer was answering Rosa Luxemburg. So he had to examine what happens in a closed economy without foreign trade when there is technical change. So he assumed the constant capital grows by 10% per year, variable capital grows by only 5% per year, PA per annum. Uh, that was Bauer's way of modeling technical change. Uh, as he put it, constant capital grows faster than variable to the extent required by technical progress. So in terms of physical quantities, the 5% growth of variable capital reflects Bauer's assumption that population and employment grow by 5%. Uh, and the 10% growth of constant capital in value terms, that reflects 10% growth of physical means of production, although he didn't exactly say the last bit explicitly. Okay, now, if the constant capital and the physical means of production both grow by 10% per year, that means that the value or price of means of production per unit is constant. Okay, and similarly, uh, for variable capital. Um, if variable capital employment both grow by 5% and consumption per worker is constant, the value of consumption goods per unit is also constant. So Bauer's scheme implicitly retains Marx's assumption of constant values of prices per unit. But that created an enormous problem Okay, since Marx assumed there's no technical progress, it made sense for him to assume that values remain constant. No rise in productivity, no rise in values. But Bauer was examining what happens when there is technical progress. So it doesn't make sense. Productivity rises, but commodities values don't fall. That's not plausible, and it also contradicts Marx's theory. Uh, Grossman was very well aware of this problem in Bauer's scheme. Uh, he provisionally took over the scheme. Uh, he tried to deal with this problem. Uh, he didn't do so properly. We'll get to that all later. Uh, but before we do, um, in order to deal with the implications uh, the properties of uh, the model, uh, I want to do a little bit of uh, math, a little bit of mathematics of growth. Um, so I call it Grossman growth math. And I'm going to be putting up a lot of stuff on the board. You don't need to copy it all down and write feverishly. Look and listen and all of the math is actually in the uh, PDF, which is on the uh, the article for the. It's in the article for this uh, class series. It's mathematics of growth and breakdown, etc. So you know, if you you want the equations and everything, you can get get the PDF. Uh, you, you don't need to copy everything down. Okay, so I want to start with. A case I want to start with a case in which uh, you put money. In a bank, $100, and you get 10% interest annually. Okay, so we're going to call that money M, and the starting time right now is time zero, so we're going to call that M sub zero. And so at M sub zero, you've got hundred dollars. After a year, we've got M sub one, you're going to have 10% more, 110. Next year, M sub two, we're going to have $11 more, 10% of that, $121. And at the end of three years, 
that's going to come out to 133.10. Simple enough. Okay. Now, the cool part of this is that this is equal to M sub O, which is $100, times 1.1 1 .1 to the third power. And this is M sub 0 times 1.1 1 .1 second power. And this is M sub 0 times 1.1 1 .1 to the first power. And M sub 0 is M sub 0, but it's equal to itself times 1.1 1 .1 to the zeroth power. And this works for any time, if you keep on trucking, at any time t, I don't know what the number is going to be, because I don't know what time we've got, but m sub t, oh, is equal to m sub zero, excuse me, times 1.1 1 .1 Keith power. Now, in terms of reading this and understanding what's going on, one complication is these T's. This T, you don't do anything with. That's just a label. This T, you exponentiate. That's a power. Second power, third power, teeth power. Okay, now it doesn't have to be money, doesn't have to be interest. Um, the mathematics of growth, as long as we have constant growth rates, like a fixed 10% interest rate, as long as we have a constant growth rate, the mathematics of growth and decay always works exactly this way. Okay, so instead of money, we can have anything uh, let's call it X. That's what the mathematicians use for anything. Okay, so we've got X sub T is equal to, for instance, X sub zero. We might have 1.05 to the teeth power, okay? And so instead of the 0.1 indicating 10%, that 0.05 indicates that X grows at 5%. We can also write it this way, X sub zero times one plus 0 0.05 to the teeth power, okay? So the, the rate of growth, is always that bit, okay? You subtract the one and you get the rate of growth. Okay, but X could be anything. But nowadays, of course, X is what was formerly known as Twitter. So we're not gonna have an X like that. We're more likely to have an X like XT is equal to X sub zero times zero point six to the teeth power. And what this tells us is that X decays. Instead of getting bigger, it shrinks. Okay. Uh, because we could write that as x sub zero times one minus zero point four p. Okay, so what that's telling us is that because of Elon Musk, the value of that company is going down by forty percent per year. Okay. Or in general, 
uh, we would have for anything x, x sub t, this is the general form, is equal to x sub zero times one plus g to the teeth power. That's the general form of this. Okay, and g is the growth rate or rate of decay of x. So, whenever you see that 1 plus g is less than 1, like with formerly known as Twitter x, okay, that means that g is less than 0 and the thing decays. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller uh, with, throughout time. If G is bigger than one, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger throughout time. And let me just show you a simple numerical example uh, of decay. Just so you can get a feel for what's going on. I'm going to be using a lot of decay terms. X sub T is equal to 16 times 0 0.5 to the t power. OK, so that's the value of x. Here's our time t, OK, 0 0.5. It's less than 1, means that the rate of growth is negative, decays. Okay. And specifically, what we're going to have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Here we're going to have 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. Okay. See if there's anything in the chat. C, yes, yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause. Can we have a word from our sponsor? Because I need to go to the bathroom, actually. Age people in discussion of Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI, aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayevskaya. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and today's many other social, political, and economic crises make this a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. In the U.S., we are 
they're faced with the threat of Trumpism triumphing and all-out authoritarianism extinguishing our right to carry on these discussions. Yet at the same moment, the multiracial movement for black lives has spread to every corner of the country and the world, launching a flood of activism and new ideas that deepen the concept of freedom. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible. We are distinguished so following him along, but if you want to tell him not to go further than some place, you can tell him. I have a problem pastoring like abolition and replacement with one good. based on the production of quote value close quote. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism, not to socialism. We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses who will form their own organization and whose emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marxist philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Our ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, women, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interests separate and apart from theirs. To this end, we open our website to the widest possible dialogue with people around the world. We intend to practice as well as espouse a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice and as the way to assure the survival of Marxist humanism. Please join us. Okay, that was our sponsor, MHI. Go ahead. Okay, um, and just a note about the group chat. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see various icons. Uh, one of them is a talking balloon. With for chat, click on that, and a chat uh, window should appear at the right of your uh, Zoom screen. Okay, uh, so what we have just done is all of the math that we need to do to understand the properties and implications of the Bauer Grossman scheme. Okay, but we also need to apply this math to the scheme's economic variables. Uh, so let's start with some what I call drugstore economics, CVS, okay? C sub T. Hold on, I think the camera went out. The camera went out. Oh. I'm good? You're back. Good. Okay. Okay, good. okay, so we're going to do some drug, drugstore economics, CVS. C sub T, we know that C grows by 10% per year. So it's equal to C sub zero times 1.1 T. We know that V and S grow at 5% per year. So V sub T is equal to V sub O, 1.05 to the T power. And S sub T is equal to S sub O times 1.05 to the T power. Okay, a couple of other things we also have talked about to this point. The uh, per unit value or price of the commodity, one commodity model in implicitly, so the price per unit or value per unit P sub T is constant. So I'm going to use a bar, call that P bar, to indicate that this is constant. 
Okay. And one more thing we know that we need to use is that the physical means of production, A, so T, The physical means of production, they grow by 10% per year. So that's A sub zero times. One point one to the T thought. Okay, and because of this, there's a couple of things that we can move ahead with. Okay, because we don't have any fixed capital here, the total constant capital is just the price of these means of production that are being produced year after year. So that's P sub T times A sub T, which is P bar times A O, A sub O, 1.1 T. Okay, and similarly, what we can do is I'm going to use W for the total value of the product. That's the whole drugstore, C plus V plus S. Okay, total value is equal to P bar times X sub T. This is not formally known as Twitter X. This is the output, physical output. Okay. So at this point, I want to if uncover all the physical quantities that are implicit in this model, primarily by virtue of the fact that the price or value per unit is constant. Okay, we've got one important result. This result on the constant capital. Okay, we also know that variable capital and surplus value grow by 5% per year. So the sum of them is that, okay, VO plus SO times 1.05 to the teeth power. And I show in the math handout that we can rewrite that as P bar X sub O minus A sub O times 1.05 to the teeth power, okay? So V sub O plus S sub O is equal to that, that's the only trick there. Okay, so we've got another important thing. We've got all of the elements of the drugstore, CVS. And because of that, and because W is equal to C plus V plus S, we can also write WT, W sub T is equal to P bar times X sub T, which we've already got. And then we just fill in plus the CT, P bar times A sub zero, 1.1 to the T power plus P bar X sub zero minus A sub zero to the one point 
1.05 to the teeth power. Okay, again, all of this is a bunch of tedious equation, equate a bunch of tedious computations at the start of the uh, PDF with the math, but all of this was worked out there. Okay, and so now we've got all of the math and all of the specification of the trajectories of the economic variables that we're going to need. Okay, so we can now move to discuss, discussing the properties and implications uh, of the reproduction scheme of Bauer and Grossman. Uh, let me see if there's any comments. Okay, none yet. Okay. Um, now, the first thing I want to talk about By way of the implications, very important matter in my view. In fact, it's the key to everything uh, in terms of the implications. Is this constraint on X, the physical amount of output. Okay. We, we know that the means of production grow by 10% per year. We know that the uh, employment of workers grows by 5% per year. We don't know yet what's happening. You know, they weren't looking at it, Bauer and Grossman. We don't know what happens to the amount of physical output X yet but we can get that extremely easily. All we need to do is divide everything here by this constant price or value P bar. So we can just zap that out. And what we get is the physical amount of output, x sub t, is equal to a sub o times 1.1 to the t power plus x sub o minus a sub o times 1.05 to the t power. Hugely consequential implication. Okay. Um, what this implies is that the growth rate of the X, the physical output, has always got to be less than the growth rate of A, the means of production. The means of production grow by 10% per year, but X grows by a smaller percentage since only that part of X is growing by 10%, well, that part of it is growing by 5%. If that's not obvious, think about you have $200 and you put $100 in one bank, $100 in the other bank. In one bank, you're getting 10% interest. In the other bank, you're getting 5% interest. Okay. Is your $200 going to grow by 10%? No. Only half of it's growing by 10%, half of it's growing by 5%. So the whole 200 is not going to be growing by 10% per year. Same thing going on here. So the physical output has got to not grow as fast as the means of production, according to this model. Although, you know, Bauer and Grossman seems not to be aware of it. Okay. This is not a plausible constraint. Why can't the physical output grow as fast or faster than the physical means of production? There's no good reason why it can't. Um, it's, this is simply a consequence of the scheme's assumption 
that the price per unit or value per unit is constant. If the commodity's price or value were allowed to fall, the physical output X could grow faster at the same rate as the means of production or even faster. So let me go back and share my screen. Okay, so you're right. W is the total value of output, X the physical amount, price per unit is P. In the Bauer-Grossman scheme, because the price of output is constant, you see that the value of X, the physical output, is being determined by the total value of the product and this constant price per unit, one, two, whatever it is, okay? But if the growth of X is not constrained by this assumption that the price per unit is constant, then we get totally different causality. The value of the, the total value of the product divided by the number of units of output, that is determining the price, okay? So different causality. And if we therefore remove the constraint on X in that manner, here's what happens. Okay, and so I've used the, the same numerical example that they use, but I let uh, the growth of uh, output X go to 10%. <clears throat> so it's equal to the growth of means of production. That causes a very rapid fall in the price per unit. Uh, quickly adjusts to fall about 4.5% per year. And that in turn causes the growth of constant capital to slow down very quickly instead of growing at 10% per year, like the means of production, uh, it slows down to growth of 5% per year. And because the constant capital is a part of the total value uh, and it's growing more slowly than the, the total value of the product, W, that's growing more slowly as well. Uh, the next thing I want to look at in terms of implications is divided by W, the constant capital share of the value of the product. And if you look at the numerical tables like that uh, Grossman constructed, this ratio starts off at one half, 50%. Uh, but by the time of breakdown, year 35, it's already up to 83%. And then, you know, if you were to con continue the calculations, it would get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, and approach one. Okay, so. The arrow here means approach. As time gets, as time goes on, that gets closer and closer to one. Well, what does that mean and why is that the case? Well, we know that C sub T is equal to, given this constant value assumption, Equal to that. We've done that. And we know that the W Andrew, value of the product. Yeah. We're getting uh, some requests that you end the screen share so we can see your writing on the board. Oh my God. Screen. Oh my God. Sorry about that. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay. So I just said. We looked at the constraint on X. Well, now I can get the ratio of the constant capital to the value of the product that approaches one. Okay. Well, why? Well, we know that C sub T is equal to that at the top, and W sub T is equal to W. 
that on the bottom. Okay, we've already done that. Okay, and now if we divide top and bottom, by the thing on the top, we get that it's equal to one, anything divided by itself is one, divided by one plus that. Oops, we got the P bar. Okay. This is this is the so-called uh, capital output ratio in physical terms. The P's cancel out. Okay, so you're just left with. That's our A, the physical amount of means of production, um, and okay. do it this way. That's the expression for A, and this, with the P's canceled out, is the expression for X. So what we've got is C sub T divided by W sub T is equal to A sub T divided by X sub T, which is that. Okay, so the reason the constant capital gets bigger and bigger and bigger in this scheme is that the means of production get bigger and bigger and bigger in relationship to the value, in relationship to the physical product. Okay. And this approaches one. Okay? How do we see that? Well, this 1.05 divided by 1.1. Okay, 1.05 is less than 1.1. Okay, so we've got a, a, a growth rate, one plus a growth rate, it's less than one, that decays. Okay, so over time, that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and we're left with one over one is equal to one. Okay, so as time goes on, what that means is that the means of production eventually become bigger and bigger and bigger in relationship to the uh, physical output. And so if this is like uh, corn and the A is seed corn, your means of production, and X is your corn output, as time goes on, you're producing, I don't know, 100 bushels of corn and you're using 99.9 .9 bushels of seed or something like that in order to uh, produce that corn, okay? It's really hard to call that technological progress. Okay, but that's a real implication of the model and has everything to do with why the model breaks down. You have an economy that's you know functioning like that, of course it's gonna break down. Okay, the final implication I wanna uh, look at at this moment is Rate of profit in the Valor Grossman model. So we could do the drugstore math, um, and we would see that if you put the, the S divided by the C over the V, that's our rate of profit. Okay, we would see that what happens is 
that approaches zero over time. And it looks like, oh, well, you know, this has everything to do with value. Um, but that's just window dressing. <laughs> uh, nothing here really has anything to do with value. Uh, what's the real reason that the rate of profit falls? Okay, I'm going to try to keep this up. So we need that result. That's the real reason that the rate of profit falls. Okay, now notice the following. I'm just gonna erase this because I need the board space. S divided by C plus V is equal to C plus V plus S minus C plus V. over C plus V, okay? That's easy enough, which means that it's equal to C plus V plus S divided by C plus V minus one. But we know that C plus V plus S is the total value of the product. Oops. That would be divided by C plus V, oh, that minus one. Now, just imagine The V is zero. Workers live on M. Just imagine. Not because we think that's true, but that tells us the maximum that the rate of profit can be. Okay. So the maximum rate of profit would be W divided by C minus one. Clearly, W divided by C plus V is gonna be smaller, okay, if V is positive. Make V zero, that's the highest that the rate of profit can be at any one time. Okay, now, why does the rate of profit fall in this model? Well, it can't be any higher than the maximum rate of profit. And that's W divided by C minus one. Well, W divided by C is the reciprocal divided by W. Okay. So it's equal to the reciprocal of that, which is just one plus okay. So that's our W divided by C. And that means we can get rid of the one. Okay. So we get some constant times a term that decays as T gets bigger. 
gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and that approaches zero. Okay. This is why the rate of profit falls, because the ratio of the means of production to the physical output gets bigger and bigger, and the output divided by the means of production gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Or in other words, the maximum rate of profit here is the ratio of output to means of production minus one. Okay. Let me make that nice. Our maximum rate of profit, that goes down to zero. And that's because the ratio of output to means of production eventually gets closer and closer and closer to one. So we've got a falling rate of profit for reasons that have nothing to do with value. Okay, it's all value form, no value substance. Just like everything in the actual scheme, and that's by virtue of the fact that the values of things are not changing. Okay, I am running very seriously behind. I am going to, I'm going to have to skip the discussion of the breakdown condition in, in, in Grossman. I've got, okay. Okay, I'm going to hold off on the uh, thing, the, the dealing with uh, the, the comment question from Seth, and I'm going to go, what I'm going to try to do now is talk about how Grossman dealt with this constant value assumption. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Okay, Grossman clearly recognized that it's implausible and contrary to Marx's theory to assume that the commodity's value is constant, even though there's technological progress. Okay, um, he said, uh, Bauer makes this constancy of values a basic part of his reproduction scheme, even though there's progressively better technology, he's fallen into a man manifest contradiction that he doesn't recognize. But with improved technology, the same product is produced with less labor, the value of the product has got to fall, and that retro retroactively affects also things produced in the past, they're devalued. So in the second stage of his work, uh, when he modified his, the, the model to develop his own theory, um, Grossman dropped this constant value assumption. Uh, he took account for the tendency of the commodity's value to fall, and he indicated how he thought it affects the breakdown tendency. Uh, he wasn't right, but uh, here's what he said. Because capital grows more rapidly in use values than in value terms, rising productivity has the effect that the accumulation of value occurs as if it were at a much lower level that makes the lifespan of accumulation prolonged. The breakdown tendency gets weakened. Uh, the breakdown doesn't occur in year 35, but at a later point. And then he said also devaluation postpones the breakdown to a more distant future because the capital of mass represents a smaller sum of value. Okay, so Grossman argued that the fall in commodities values causes a slower growth of the constant capital, and that in turn causes a slowdown of the breakdown process. But what is his argument linking slower growth of the constant capital to a slower breakdown process rather than, for instance, no breakdown process anymore? He gave no argument for that in his book. But Right after his book was published, uh, Otto Bauer's colleague, wife, Elaine Bauer, wrote a review of Grossman's book, and she challenged um, 
what he said, uh, you know, about the, the, the breakdown in conditions of f falling values. Okay. Uh, Grossman obviously thought that it was obviously correct that, you know, there would be just slower growth of constant capital, slower breakdown process. He didn't think he needed to give a, an argument, uh, but Helene Bauer charged that Grossman had neglected the weakening tendency of devaluation. He had mentioned it, but what Grossman concluded is what she was saying is that devaluation occurs, and because of that, the existing tendency to break down is not simply weakened, it's overcome. So in his unpublished response, Grossman realized he had come up with an argument, and here's his argument as to why falling commodity values don't overcome the breakdown tendency. He said, the simplest reflection shows that the proposition that the devaluation of uh, capital abrogates or overcomes the tendency to break down, okay, that proposition necessarily entails that there is no development of an ever higher organic composition of capital. In other words, what he's saying is, okay, the fall in values leads to a slower growth of constant capital, and that leads to a slower growth, but still growth of the organic composition of capital, by which he basically meant the ratio of constant to variable capital, C divided by V. So because there is still growth of constant to variable capital, therefore there's gonna be a slower breakdown process rather than no breakdown process. But what was his argument for that link between slower growth of C divided by V and a slower breakdown process? No argument. And he didn't think he needed to give an argument for reasons that we know. He said, the simplest reflection shows this. Okay, but in fact, he was not right. It does not necessarily entail that. Uh, here's just a simple example from uh, using the spreadsheet that accompanies my 2021 article. Simple growth rates, constant rate of surplus value, accumulation, 25% of surplus value is accumulated. So there is no overaccumulation, not, you know, more and more and more of the surplus value being accumulated, no overaccumulation. So there's no breakdown, yet there is an ever higher ratio of constant to variable capital. It goes up from 12 to almost eventually to 24. Okay, so he, he, he's just wrong that if C over V uh, is rising, then we've got to have a breakdown. Okay, the upshot is when you assume you make an ass of you and me, as Felix Unger said. Okay, but we're bound to hear that Feynman's bendy curve thing, this bendy curve, Okay, that's just a mathematical freak case. We know that in the real world, when growth occurs, it occurs the way Grossman and his devotees say. If something is growing ever higher and higher and higher, its growth is going to be unlimited. Uh, for example, Homo sapiens have a breakdown tendency, the absolute overaccumulation of stature. They have an inevitable, purely physical tendency to break down. From birth, they get taller and taller, but their skeletal structure cannot support a height of more than about nine feet. From birth to 208 weeks, four years, their average height increases by 1.7 feet, and they keep growing. So after about 940 weeks or 18 years, they're more than nine feet tall, and they break down. Wrong. Okay. They don't do that. Growth occurs in a different way. Okay, so to summarize the discussion to this point, for a long run breakdown tendency due to so-called insufficient surplus value, you not only have to have the organic composition or value composition C over V rising, the rise has to be permanent, at least until the moment of breakdown. 
And the rise has to be without limit. Something like a straight line rise instead of this bendy curve rising to a limit. Okay, stop share. I should be back here. Um, okay, I'm going to go very quickly and summarize why Marx's value theory implies that there is no long run breakdown tendency. Um, and Again, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. My 2021 article proved that if commodities values fall in the way that Marx's value theory says, there cannot be a Grossman style breakdown tendency. No empirical evidence whatsoever can ever confirm Grossman's breakdown theory. I'll, if we have time, I'll talk about the empirical evidence. But if Marx's value theory is correct, okay, then it can't exist. Okay. When I say that my article proved this, what do I mean by proved? What's the significance of proof? And exactly what did I do to prove it? Okay. A deductive proof, you begin with premises, you derive a conclusion or conclusions from the premises and nothing else. And the significance of this is, in general, that a valid, you do it right, a valid deductive proof provides a guarantee that truth is preserved. If all of your premises are true, then the conclusions must be true. And you don't have to appeal to the world. It's going to be true without any exceptions. Okay? So I got just... The total value is the used up constant capital value and the new value, the new value continually increases. And then the stuff that we did uh, today, and I was able to derive that equation, um, the first purple arrow. And on the basis of the first purple arrow, uh, I was able to show that the ratio of constant capital to the new value does not increase without limit. It converges to a finite limiting value. And because of that, okay, because it's a bendy curve thing and not a straight line curve thing, there is no long run breakdown tendency. Okay. And so what we can see is the importance of this term, uh, A sub T plus one divided by uh, one plus the gross growth rate of new value times the uh, physical output. Okay, if that's less than one, um, C divided by N converges. Uh, it doesn't grow without limit. And uh, I was able to prove that that has to be the, the case. Um, okay, let me, let me just say a, a couple of additional words. This does not, strictly speaking, prove that a physical kind of breakdown uh, is impossible. Okay? It doesn't prove, strictly speaking, that supply is insufficient to meet physical demand. Uh, physical demand can always pick up for some reason. Physical supply could drop for some reason, and then you'd have a, a Grossman-style breakdown. But it's, it's not inevitable. It's not a tendency. It's not even really plausible. Um, why isn't it plausible? Well, one thing that I've been stressing today is it's not plausible because it's just not plausible that the physical amount of output is unable to keep up with the physical amount of means of production. That's inevitable that it doesn't keep up in the model, but it's not inevitable in reality. The other thing, which I think is even more important, uh, and uh, Esteban's comments from last time go to this issue, at least some of his comments go to this issue, is that this idea from Grossman that the surplus value is insufficient to satisfy next year's accumulation, what does that even mean? Okay, 
Well, in Grossman's model and Grossman's theory, the growth of accumulation is predetermined. Okay, so then you get, okay, 10% that, 5% that. So the question becomes whether the supply and whether the surplus value is sufficient to satisfy that demand. Okay, but that's backwards. It puts the effect before the cause. In reality, you don't have accumulation gods descending from heaven and saying, thou shalt increase thy constant capital by 10% and thy variable capital by 5%. That's not how it works. Okay, the growth of investment demand. I should stop my screen share. The growth of investment demand is not predetermined. It's determined by the capitalists themselves and is determined on the basis of how much surplus value or profit they have and what portion of the surplus value or profit they decide to invest. So the, the actual causality is first there's production of the surplus value, generation of profit. Then there's a the decision about how to divvy it up, how much to accumulate as additional capital and how much to distribute to the owners as revenue. And then and only then is there the use of the additional capital to buy more means of production and hire more workers to do the actual investment. Once you think of it that way, the whole problem disappears of the insufficiency of surplus value to meet you know, the needed accumulation. Because I'm running extremely late, I'm gonna to have to uh, cut it there. Um, and we still have the one thing from Seth. I'm going to turn the floor over to Alan, who's very patient and I'm sure extremely tired and he needs no introduction because he was introduced last time. Okay, is it me now? Yeah. Um, to, I've got earphones on because I'm wanting to disturb the other person in the flat, but I'm going to take them off because otherwise I can't hear myself speak. Okay, now I'm reading now from my own notes, so I just want to check that everybody can hear what I'm saying. Is that okay? Looks like it. Um, yes, you're coming through. Thumbs up. So I want to make a couple of preliminary points. I think that the issues raised by Andrew are significantly important that I would very much welcome a third session or some place where we can have this discussion uh, extended. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's unfortunate that Andrew ran out of time, had to rush himself and so on. Uh, we want to go into this more. Second is I must apologize to the everybody, including the other commentators, for jumping the gun, asking to go first, and for leaving this discussion before they comment. This is uh, very unfortunate, and I will watch the video at the end, but it's just because I, I have to catch uh, a very long flight tomorrow, and I've just had another very long flight, and... I'm getting on, so I can't cope with that. <laughs> this is my method. Now, the third final point is a very important one, is to inform you of something that's going on. And this is that uh, in 1992, before I met Andrew, I produced a computer simulation of the process of reproduction. I didn't use uh, any of the assumptions that Luxembourg, Bukharin, Bauer, or Grossman, I use what I thought were Marx's assumptions, and in particular included fixed capital in a model. And this more or less behaved the way that Marx predicted, including uh, cycles that were related to the turnover time of fixed capital. And at that point, I thought, okay, now this looks to me like you know, Marx has got things right, and let's look at the theory, and I met Andrew and the rest is history. But I keep coming back to it every now and again. And recently there's been an important development, which is a number of other people have become interested in that simulation model and have been interested in producing their own simulations. 
And in fact, there's a group that is coming together to do that. Now, this is going to prove out relevant to the comments I'm going to make because we can do things that we couldn't do with the, the technology available to Grossman, which was basically pen and paper. We can actually test what happens if we vary the assumptions that go in and sort of run the calculation, say, hey, computer, tell us what will happen if you assume this rate of growth or that or whatever. So there's a second two outcomes of that is that there is a discussion group which we're starting to read capital volume two and i would suggest that this is an unusual thing amongst readers of capital you get capital one groups then people kind of go okay let's read capital two that's pretty boring and then you get the fun stuff which is capital three well i think the new thing that's now developing is that the capital two study is coming to the fore and is very important and finally, we have, I think I can say this, uh, agreement from the editorial board of research in political economy that there will be a special issue of RIP on uh, value in Marx's reproduction schemes and that that will be open for submission. So if any of the people in this session who are interested in putting their remarks into the form of a publishable paper, I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, issue of RIP in 2025. Now, let me now skip to the substance of what I want to say. Now, in my first set of comments, I suggested for discussion the following. What do the schemas contribute to our understanding of capitalism? And the answer I gave is an enormous amount, but not on the basis established in the Luxembourg, Bukhara and Bauer Grossman debate. In other words, I think that this has been, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, a red herring. It's taken the debate about what volume two really does have to tell us down the wrong road. And the reason I gave is the issue of breakdown, and there are the crisis tendencies in capitalism, and there is a problem because these crisis tendencies have not been explained by non-TSA, by simultaneist Marxism. So we do have to investigate the causes of capitalism's contradictions, but you cannot find these in the schemas of reproduction. The real issue is how reproduction is affected by contradictions arising from accumulation, and I'm going to argue these are independent of the assumptions in the schemas themselves. Now, I can amplify this in the following way. Marx actually says, I didn't find the exact text, having done simple reproduction, he says, well, there are a million ways that things go wrong. So, as I said last time, this is because the reproduction scheme is best understood as a possibility theorem. It's possible for capitalism to reproduce, but it may not. Well, the point is, which of these million ways actually happens? And that's what the reproduction schemas don't tell us. I can make an analogy with gravity that Andrew and I are both fond of, uh, talking about gravity. I mean, don't mean this particular analogy, but I'll put it like this. If somebody jumps off a cliff and dies, cause of death is not gravity. Cause of death is jumping off a cliff. What gravity tells us is how the body reaches the ground. I mean, the gory details of the death. So the schemas, when something does go wrong, and there are a million ways that it can go wrong, wrong, it doesn't tell us what the cause is, because the cause is not contained in the schemas, cannot be derived from the schemas. It tells us how that process will unfold, or I'm going to suggest it might. Now, here's my take on what Andrew has shown, which I've sort of scribbled down as he was speaking, so he hasn't seen this argument yet. But what he's basically shown, stepping right back from it, is that Grossman's schema's breakdown, the breakdown does not arise because of reproduction as such. They arise because of Grossman's specific assumptions about how reproduction proceeds, the growth of C, the growth of B, the growth of S, and so on. And he happens to choose specific assumptions which are incompatible. So what he does is he says, let's suppose capitalism jumps off a cliff. Not surprisingly, in the reproduction schemas, they do show that he falls off a cliff, but that's not because of reproduction. It's because of jumping off the cliff. If we plug in different assumptions, I speculate, capitalism doesn't jump off the cliff. So his thesis is unproven. However, 
we do know that capitalism has embedded in it historical tendencies, such as the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And we do know that these are not inevitable, but unless they are offset by countervailing tendencies or by some intervention, such as going to war, and this is what caused the recovery of the US rate of profit in 1942, which countermands these historical tendencies, these, these do cause capitalism to jump off a cliff. Now that process of falling is very complicated. It involves these periodic crises, it involves the accumulation of, of spurious financial assets, uh, all kinds of processes, which are properly speaking part of reproduction, but they're not an outcome of reproduction. Now, the TSSI study of the law of tendency rate of profit to fall unambiguously leads to the conclusion that the fall of rate of profit takes place as long as there is accumulation. That means that this will be independent of how accumulation proceeds. If you try to deduce the LTRPF from reproduction, you're going to fail. Because no matter how that accumulation proceeds, no matter what assumptions you plug in, the rate of profit will fall, provided that value itself accumulates, which is what accumulation is about. It's about the accumulation of value, not physical products. And I think if you check out Law's uh, Marx's TRPF, uh, this becomes perfectly clear. Now, putting that preamble in has shortened the time that I have. So I'm going to, as briefly as I can, go over the question, what do the reproduction schemes actually tell us? Um, I suggested they, I suggest, I speculate, it's a thesis, I haven't proved it, that they may help us answer questions of the type, how does the fall proceed? For example, what is the relation between the rate of profit or the rate of growth of department one and the rate in department two. That's the kind of question we might, learn, we might want to ask. What do you have to do if you're the state and you want to countermand the fall? Um, should you concentrate on department one? Should you concentrate on department two? And can you actually interrupt the fall? Is that even possible within the framework of, of, of private accumulation of capital? And I asked, can the reproduction schemas help provide the answer to questions like that? And I suggest that they do, but to understand the answer to that question, we actually need to do what TSSI did for what I call the volume three debate, which is to say, well, what, what's Marx's answer? Not what's Luxembourg's answer or Bowers or Grossman, but what does Marx think? And I think that we can go further than has been done in answering the question, how does Marx approach reproduction? And I suggest that what we find is that Marx doesn't think in the same way as the contributes, contributors to that debate. That is, just as in the volume three debate, as I call it, on transformation, we had to reclaim Marx's actual views, such as the monetary expression of labor time to which Ramos, for example, contributed an enormous amount, which is not acknowledged subsequently by our participants who just expropriated the melt and treat it as if nobody as if they invented it. Um, in the volume two debate on reproduction, we need to study and reclaim his actual theory. That, that's my sort of thesis. Now, what are the obstacles to that? I suggested one small thing in my previous remarks and I sent this to Andrew, that one problem is uh, a tendency to assume that the use value of a thing is identical with its physical properties. Now, this is a very complex issue, but I do urge everyone to read this. It's the simplest reading task you could possibly have. Just read page one, chapter one, volume one of Capital. And I don't think the way that Marx introduces uh, use value allow us to identify the use value of a thing with its physical properties. But that's a complex issue and it's not necessary to resolve it for this discussion and so I'm not going to go into that. So I'm going to turn to the main issue, which is Borkovich's simplifications. And Borkovich, you'll recall, has set out the framework that all simultaneist Marxists have used. And these have been largely adopted 
whenever TSSI scholars wish to refute Borkovich's proof of the contradictions in Marx and proofs of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. But that said, that's fine. You, you, you can only disprove Borkovich on the basis of Borkovich's simplifications. But if you want to investigate Marx's view, these simplifications constrict, constitute a considerable obstacle. So what does he assume? All capitals turn over exactly once a year. Their turnovers are synchronized. They all start and end at the same time in that glorious point at the end of the period when everybody suddenly exchanges the results of production. And that's the third assumption. All products are actually sold at a single point in time at the end of the period. Alan, sorry to interrupt. Now, um, Marx did not make these assumptions. Can you hear me? And they make a difference. So they're unacceptable if we want to establish the general relevance of Marx's theory of production. And the basic reason is quite simple. It's fixed capital, as, as, as Andrew has, uh, I think, tangentially referred to, but it's very important. In the Borkovich system, there is no fixed capital. Every attempt to theorize it has actually failed. The simultaneous admit that you get insoluble contradictions if you try and reintroduce joint of that into the, the Sraffian treatment. And Sraffa has an idea that he suggests, which is that fixed capital reproduces itself each year. It, sort of, it, it, it completely turns over, but it produces a new set of fixed capital, so-called vintage of capital. And this leads to insoluble contradictions, which they, they don't seem to think is such a problem as the contradiction they claim to have discovered in Marx. But what we've got to look at is Marx's treatment of fixed capital. Now, there's, there's two further reasons for this choice. Marx's formulation, now I, I have to correct myself slightly because I think I wrote in my remarks to uh, Andrew that, that Marx does not assume the turnover of capital completely in a year. I, having reread that, I think there is a statement that he will make this as a simplifying assumption, but it's not necessary for the schemas of reproduction. You can more or less develop the schemas of reproduction without that assumption. So it is simplifying assumption. It's not a necessary condition. In Borkovich, it's necessary. You have to make that assumption or Borkovich's stuff just doesn't work. So the real issue is what is turned over during the process, and that's not going to be the whole of the capital. Moreover, not all capital turns over at the same time. And crucially, even if you assume that the turnover of fixed capital is complete over a year, in Marx's formulation, it can turn over many times in the course of the year. That's not the same assumption as Borkovich. And recent scholarship has started to investigate how Marx actually treats that. The reason this is important is because of the role of moral depreciation. This is the decline in the value of the deployed fixed capital that is independent of the destruction of its use value. And this plays an integral role, both in the contradictions of capital themselves and the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. So it's really very incomplete if you start trying to study either reproduction or the TRPF on the basis that you see all capital Sorry to mute you there, Alan. I don't know if you could put your headphones back on uh, here. And yeah, headphones, headphones. Hold on. Let me start the video. Put your head, your, your headphones in your, your headphones in. Um, if you could put your, and I'll ask you to unmute, but we need you to move to wrapping up here. Hold on. You'll, you'll get. Alan, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Head headphones. I'm back. Can you see headphones? Okay. Um, I can't hear you guys very well, but I can hear myself. Can you hear me? Stick a thumb up if you can hear me. We need you to wrap up if you could. Could you put your headphones I on? I don't know why. The your headphones are out. Oh, because somebody has muted my audio. Say something. Say something. Hello? 
Are you there? Okay, I can yes. hear you now. Alan, could you could you wrap up? Because we, we need to move to the other discussions. I'm sorry. Thank you, though. Okay, I'll just make one final very simple point, which is this is not a debate between Simultaneous and Temporalists. This is a debate amongst Temporalists. The Luxembourg-Grossman-Bauer debate is all done in a temporal manner. Therefore, it's a new kind of debate, but it's a good debate for TSSI because we don't need to engage with the stupid falsifications of the simultaneous, and we can actually get down to the business in a, a what I hope will be a, a mutually supportive, although so far it's a shame that we don't have any participation from the other participants from the Grossman side. But what's possible, and I'm it's one of the reasons I'll finish on this, that we hope the debate will unfold in the RIP special edition and in a discussion group that we hope will be set up for the purpose. The discussion can proceed in such a way that we do engage with uh, people who uh, who generally agree with Grossman, and that, that ought to be a productive debate. So I'll finish on this point. And, and I'm very sorry, but now I have to leave you. This is such a tragedy, but that's why you need a third session. Anyway, I'm done. I'll stay around long enough for any quick comments that anybody before the others, and then I, I, I really wish I could hear Sebastian and everybody. I'll see the video. I'm done. And am I being heard? Yes. Okay, uh, before we get to Sebastian, I wanna say uh, Nick Potts was expected. He received a notification on Friday. He responded, he's looking forward to it. I don't know what's happened with him. I wanna hear from Andrew, Sebastian. Yeah. Nick is Nick is here, he is here. He okay. is, he is uh, Harvey in the chat, but he is here. Oh, okay, he is here, okay. Yeah. Uh, I wanna get to the, 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 the other two discussions, but I wanna, uh, you know, the, the other participants have been um, very patient. So I want to very quickly uh, go into a couple of things. First of all, Stephanie asked if I could, like, give real-world examples. And, you know, I, you can't do that at every moment because it would have taken an additional 20 minutes. But um, if you want to, because it's a one-sector model, X you can think of as corn. Okay, the production of corn and A, the means of production, you can think of it as the seed corn that you plant or sow um, to produce the corn output. And those are the two physical variables that we're really working with here. Now, um, Seth says, Bauer and Grossman's interpretation of their model seems to endorse the extremes of classical physicalism. Untapped physical resources means potential accumulation, uh, but capitalism will break down. I have to clarify this. The stuff that I've been doing on the implications of the Bauer-Grossman scheme, you will not find any discussion of that in either Bauer or Grossman. This is not what they were intending to say. It is what they were saying implicitly. It is what the scheme implies by virtue of the assumption that the value per unit of the commodity is constant. Okay, this is not what they meant to say, but you know, I don't care about what they meant to say. What I care about is what are the implications of the scheme? In my discussion today. So please do keep in mind that, you know, it's not that Kleinman is saying that, you know, Grossman was a physicalist or Bauer was a physicalist, or this is what they were trying to do. They were not. They were trying to do something different, but the assumption that the value per unit is constant leads you to this stuff, and it leads to a breakdown for purely physical reasons, and it leads to a fall in the rate of profit to zero or below for purely uh, physical reasons. Uh, there is a comment from Ravi that I'm going to, um, I hope that I can get to it later. So uh, Sebastian has been extremely patient. 
Uh, let me introduce him and then he can um, speak with us. Uh, Sebastian Hernandez is an economist from Mexico who works in the Division of Labor Markets in the Inter-American Development Bank. He writes about Marxist economic theory. Uh, his most recent publications are about work intensity. Hernandez also translates Marxist writings on economics and politics into Spanish, and his translations are published in the Tiempos Criticos website. And there is a link uh, in the article to the classes on the MHI website. Uh, so please take it away, Sebastian. Okay, thank you very much. Do you listen to me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So I will be very brief because I think that the, the, the further discussion is, is more important. Uh, first, I would like to thank Marxist Humanist Initiative for the invitation, as well as Andrews for having me here today. Uh, well, now, uh, the first thing I would like to state is uh, to all the audience that is struggling with the math and still have some doubts, uh, is that the notes for this class and the previous one, as well as the interactive uh, spreadsheet that Andrew did, are very help helpful. And I'm sure that if you keep on studying them, you will certainly succeed, because they're really really clear uh, the, the the notes for the previous uh, class uh, i think they are very straightforward to understand um the argument that andrews did and it's all what he did in this class i would also like to warn you that i think you shouldn't take a stance about grossman's and until you fully understand what andrew did uh, because otherwise you will be unconsciously taking a, a political position without a, having a, a theoretical one and I believe the key is understanding the difference between Marx's theory of crisis and Grossman's theory of crisis, or even if it's not a theory of crisis, what we could call as, he do, as if it was. Uh, this, is, this difference is what Andrews explains in his 2021 writing. And I believe you should also refer to Andrews, Alan, Nick, Alexei, and Brendan writing on Heinrich, because I, I believe there uh, you will find a great explanation about what is Marx's theory of crisis. Now, about uh, this class in particular, or, or, or what we are discussing, I think this breakdown of capitalism is crucial for two reasons. Uh, as Andrew says, uh, it's, an issue, it's an issue about the truth. Here, I think Andrew has proved that Grossman's assertion that capitalism will have an inexorable breakdown for pure econo economic reasons is false. Yes, it might happen, but it is highly improbable. His paper is forceful on Grossman's mistakes and particularly on Grossman's silences. I believe the biggest mistake was that Grossman knew about the failures of Bauer's model where counter tendencies were not fully accounted for, and nevertheless, he underestimated them as mere retardants of the collapse without any further analysis. What Andrew did was to fill Grossman's silence with a true understanding of the underlying causes of the alleged breakdown. And once this is done, we can be sure that there is no breakdown at all. But the silence is meaningful in other sense. And here is the second point I would like to discuss and Andrew to comment about. The political relevance of Andrew's disproval of Grossman's breakdown. Grossman's silences were his political hope for a, for a historical change. His hope was supported by beliefs and not knowledge or a proven theory. These theoretical silences allow, allow now others to fill the gap with the political blindness of fatalism and is worrisome for today's world political context. Here I think Andrew's major contribution is to provide us with the theoretical guidance for a non-biased political perspective. And here my question to Andrew, what do you think is the practical usefulness of your writing in the coming years for the world political context? To finish, I would like to say that Alan's talk about the relevance of Marx's reproduction scheme is also crucial, and it, may, and it may be the theme for a future class because there is also a lot of confusion about what Marx intended with these uh, reproduction schemes. Now that uh, uh, Alan said that um, they're preparing a, um, an issue um, of the RIP on these reproduction schemes, um, I recall that Andrews did one um, uh, talking about the reproduction schemes as an um, unbalanced um, growth. And I think 
uh, as, as Alan said, it's a discussion between uh, temporalists and it, it should be deeply uh, investigated in order to provide people with an understanding of what might happen in the future now that the world is having um, different rhythms of, of growth in different parts of the world. So that's uh, all I want to say, and maybe we'll, we'll uh, talk about later. But I, I, I would like Andrew to comment on this political perspective of what he did. I'll certainly try to find time to do so, uh, at least briefly. Uh, but let's uh, hear from our other discussant, Nick Potts. And... Hello, Andrew. Hi, Nick. Okay, got to introduce you, then go ahead. Uh, Very he... quickly. Nick is an emeritus professor of economics. He's written about Marx's value theory since the year 2000. His work has been split between arguing for the temporal single system interpretation of Marx and trying to apply Marx's consistent theory of value to the world, considering crisis, inequality, knowledge, the environment, and finance. Uh, Nick has been on the Capital Class Editorial Board since 2005, coordinating papers concerning Marx's value theory. He is also co-editor of the 2015 collection, Is Marx's Theory of Profit? Right. Good to see you, Nick. Take it away. Yeah, nice to see you, Andrew. I've been like sneakily here pretending to be Harvey all along just to confuse you. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is just can, much... can people hear Nick? Is the sound quality okay? Well, you yeah, got a sound? Yeah, okay, go ahead. So, so the first thing I'll say is just how much I liked your really elegant mathematical like proof of how Grossman's theory is not about value theory and how the breakdown does occur through an arbitrary route. And I think it's absolutely great um, that, you know, the way you've summed it up and you've done it mathematically, like, you know, just in the way that you've done. But thinking about all of this does, like, remind me of how I came across, like, um, thinking about this question and probably mainly knew about it back in 2008. Um, because I've been asked to review Rick and book about Grossman's life. And then I just, like read in there about breakdown and this, that, and the other about what Grossman thought. And then I, when I read like um, Grossman's 1929 book, I just want to explain the context in which I arrived at it. I arrived at it in a context which I thought I could really engage with it because I had been considering, you know, working in the temporal single system interpretation of Marx. I've been spending quite a number, you know, quite a number of years doing work on spreadsheets in which I come to understand the importance of sequentiality. I understand the importance of like, of whether you hold technological progress steady or not. I, you know, I understood the questions like which come up when you try to model a growing economy because I had the luxury of following an approach to Marxist value theory, which encouraged me to be sequential, which encouraged me to like go and experiment and see if I could put it into practice by drawing up spreadsheets, which look through what happened to an economy year by year. So when I like initially saw what Grossman was doing in his 1929 book, compared to what was being written by simultaneous Marxists, on general Marxist debate at the time over the TSSI or the falling rate of profit or the transformation problem. I really thought that what Grossman would do and was an advance, was a really worthy thing to be reading. Now, through um, being able to model it on a spare, you know, a spreadsheet sequentially, I think if I remember, I came to the conclusion that what Grossman was doing seemed rather arbitrary and unnecessary. And his, and his breakdown simply came from the way that he defined the growth process. And I don't think I like realize the widest political significance of it at the time. And just as like Andrew did in his 21 paper, you can easily adjust his scheme so you don't have this false breakdown and you just have a long falling rate of profit sequence. And I remember at the time that um, I was like, 
far more interested in the sense that that what Grossman was saying was at least recognizing the falling rate of profit. He was like recognizing that it was so crucial to crisis. So this is why this class has been particularly important to me. So I like realize a wider context of how like he might have been defending Marx and defending, you know, and looking at the falling rate of profit in a serious way. And in his outside of his model, in his further like comments on crisis, he was saying some very interesting things about this. But it's not until I've been to this class I really realised that, like, that there was a wider context of why he was looking for that solution of a breakdown. So thank you very much for that. Now, I remember, like, that I found reading Grossman's work very useful. I happened to uh, like read this book in two thousand and eight, reading about Grossman talking about surplus capital, and talking about. Um, how like a falling rate of profit could lead to like surplus capital and in it and the financial sector having an over you know an over accumulate well a fictitious bubble and Grossman was not just saying that it was like his idea this surplus capital he was referring me back to Marx and making me look at Marx and talk about surplus capital and think about in Marx, where he talks about in volume three, about, about financial, like, you know, about financial bubbles and you can, um, and how you can have a financial crisis occur, which is actually being caused by a low rate of profit, but it appears to be purely, purely a financial crisis. So in a sense, although Grossman's reproduction schemes <laughs> add up, and although, like, um, um, his breakdown theory was wrong. He like he you know he did like like bring me to thinking about um, about why the a financial crisis could be caused ultimately by low profitability in the productive economy. And like what a year to do it in two thousand and eight. So like I think like what I would like to say is that I enjoy reading Grossman. But I still think there's a value in reading Grossman. But with this health warning from Andrew about how how some of his like stuff, which he claims to be scientific, is not very scientific at all. Um, I wonder if he would have made more progress on understanding it if he had access to an Excel spreadsheet back then and could have like made the calculations easier. Whereas we do have access to Excel spreadsheets, and I personally found myself that building models and see how they change and thinking about their assumptions was a very good way of trying to understand Marx's value theory. Because I'd have to make decisions on how I built the spreadsheets. And then like, I would like think, well, what does it say in Marx's value theory? Then I would like get in contact with Alan and Andrew and say, well, there's this decision I have to make. Um, and it enabled me to, you know, to explore the issue in a way which I would recommend to all of you that you can build spreadsheets and you can explore processes of accumulation and it's a valuable tool to do um and it does excite me the idea of the a debate over the reproduction schemes being a sequential debate as alan said so i can't really think of a lot else to say other than much, how much i have enjoyed and appreciated being here and and listening to everybody thank you very much uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I am temporarily without video because it's being recharged. Uh, so let me um, first of all uh, address, th thank Sebastian as well. Um, let me address, I think, uh, Sebastian's comments about uh, truth being at stake is very important and also Nobody should take a stand on any of this until you understand, you know, Grossman well enough. You understand my critique well enough, because otherwise you're just, you know, following the leader. And, you know, if the leader can lead you to the promised land, the leader can lead you away from the promised land. So one really needs to, to think about this uh, and not just to, to take a stand based on intuitions or what conclusions you like. Um, what is the political 
relevance of what I've done with respect to Grossman. Well, I hope that I have tried to open up some space for consideration of Marx's actual crisis theory, which is often conflated with and replaced by, you know, Grossman, uh, Grossman's breakdown theory. Uh, as I said, I mean, I've encountered over the years that most of the people who say that they, you know, subscribe to or whatever, Marx's theory are actually replacing it with this absolute overaccumulation, you know, not enough surplus value, all, all of this stuff. Um, Marx actually has a very rich crisis theory, and so many people don't like his crisis theory. I'll tell you, you know, I was trying to talk about that in the moment people began to understand on the left that Marx's crisis theory um, leads to a falling rate of profit, you know, but that means that the falling rate of profit means that the capitalists have, haven't pummeled the working class and taken everything and neoliberalism hasn't meant humongous profits, you know, for, for the wealthy. The moment they saw that the, the, the redistributionist story didn't work well with Marx's crisis theory, they chose the redistributionist story. So it's really hard to get people to take Marx's crisis theory, you know, seriously. The conflation of Marx and Grossman makes that even harder. I hope I hope I've opened up some space for consideration of Marx's actual theory, which I think is really it needs to be taken seriously. It's a very serious theory. The other thing is to combat fatalism. Uh, you know, I gave some arguments against fatalism. I'd like to give an argument against, uh, if I have time, this idea that you can predict inevitability, which is, that's a contradiction in terms. But people go around, we're going to predict that it's inevitable, that capitalism breaks down, that makes no sense. Uh, but I gave my arguments against fatalism in the 2021 paper, what I've been doing here and the rest of it is not a argument against fatalism. It's a challenge to the fatalists. It's telling them, at least insofar as they're fatalists on the basis of Grossman, their stuff doesn't work. Uh, let me just say very briefly about uh, Nick's comments. I too got my start on spreadsheets, uh, actually with a super calc uh, spreadsheet, you know, well before uh, Excel or a Commodore 64 computer uh, back in 1986. And th that's how I knew that there was something wrong with what Grossman was doing, even before Grossman's book gets published in English in 1992. I see it in 93 or something. And I look at this and I say, uh-uh, because -uh. I've been modeling these kinds of situations on the spreadsheet and there's no breakdown, not as long as you have like reasonable assumptions. So that's the thing. If you begin with reasonable assumptions, there's no breakdown. The Grossman process is reverse. You begin with your conclusions, okay? Constant capital's got to grow this much, variable capital grows this much without seeing how the physical quantities are moving and the value per unit is moving. You impose your conclusions and then of course you, you're going to get a breakdown. Um, I, I do think that it would have been a lot easier, yes. Uh, I've said this m many times. If, if Bauer, particularly Grossman, who was doing long-term stuff, was if he were able to run you know, uh, spreadsheet simulations, I think he would have done a better job uh, checking himself. Um, there is a comment from uh, Ravi um, or question. He says, since it's inconceivable that the capitalist state would not intervene in a failing economy or that capitalists would not find new ways as part of crisis measures to partially restore profitability, why do we still today need to have models of, or thought experiments that run a worst case scenario? If you're asking me my opinion, this is one of the reasons I loathe models. I absolutely hate models. People think I do models because I do math, okay? But what I'm not trying to do is produce a simplification of reality, you know, as it actually works. That's
Okay. And then you, you get one. Yeah. Oh, uh, integrated with them. You weren't integrated. Yeah, just a lot of charges. Okay. So can... Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm, you know, this this idea of okay, well, we're going to produce a, a full scale model of the economy. Well, you got to produce a full scale model of the economy together with the realistic state intervention, you know, and together with the the what's going to happen by the social movements, their response to it, and other uh, state actors and. It never ends, and then somebody, what do they do? They criticize your assumptions, and they got different assumptions. I, I have never found this approach to reality to be at all helpful of making simplifications, making conclusions that are based on the simplifications, and that work only insofar as the assumptions work, and then going out and testing it. I just think the whole thing is, is wrong. I, I tried not to do that. I try to understand partial processes and, and how they work. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think anybody would say that a model of the economy free from state intervention is realistic. I think that they're basically saying, well, what if the state were not to intervene? Here's what would happen, blah, 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 blah. But again, it's all based on your assumptions and other people got other assumptions and then you're not sure about what you're saying. So you got to go test it. Uh, I, I don't have enough years left for that kind of stuff. Um, and we have a quote from Grossman given to us by Van. The point of breakdown theory is that the revolutionary action of the proletariat only received its most powerful impetus from the objective convulsion of the established system. And at the same time, this only creates the circumstances necessary to successfully wrestle down the ruling class's resistance. Okay, very nice flowery words. What I would say to that is Grossman does not have a mechanical breakdown theory. He's got a mechanical breakdown tendency. And it's that mechanical breakdown tendency where the breakdown is not being driven, you know, by the action of the oppressed, the working class and others. Okay. It's just a purely economic breakdown tendency. But then, you know, the, the, the capitalists aren't getting enough surplus value. So they begin to squeeze the workers and then the workers fight back. Okay, that's what he's talking about right there, Grossman is. Okay, it's this marriage of a mechanical, purely economic breakdown tendency with the response of the workers to having their wages cut. Okay, I'm, I'm translating it into to, to plain English. Uh, I, I don't happen to think very much of it, but... Um, Let's see what others have to say, discussants, other participants. Uh, while we're waiting, we may have a, a couple of minutes. I would like to do an additional session. Uh, I don't know if MHI wants to put the resources into you know, videography each time and so forth, but I think we could do a, a third uh, session uh, for those who are interested. Uh, I, I have a lot of differences with a lot of things that uh, Adam Freeman was saying, but he, he, he's, he's aware of that. Maybe we can discuss some of that, uh, you know, in a third session and, and maybe some of other things. After people have uh, studied this more, uh, they might be able to come up with additional thoughts and questions and so forth. Um, Seth has written in, in his opinion, belief in the breakdown tendency has much to do with the 2008 recession, uh, but also climate change. Um, okay, he, he meant to revise that to uh, recent interest in, in the idea of a breakdown tendency has a lot to do with the 2008 recession and climate change. I, 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 I would agree. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, so concern over breakdown, you know, if you're talking about the climate breakdown, I mean, that's a real thing, but it doesn't have anything really to do with the corn 
you know, uh, output not growing as fast as the seed core and input. Uh, that's not what it's about, to state the obvious. Does anybody want a final word? I thank the discussants for their thoughtful and, and supportive comments. Uh, I thank the participants for hanging in through two sessions that have been very rushed. Thank Alan Freeman for coming to us twice from halfway around the world, uh, early hours of the morning. Uh, thank uh, Gabriel Donnelly for steering us in terms of the, the tech, uh, Andrew Clark for being on top of everything, uh, and thank our videographer from last time, Sky, and our videographer from today, uh, Aiden. Uh, and again, if you have questions, comments, uh, you can always write to me if you don't have my personal email address. You can get in touch with me by writing to the MHI email, which is on the MHI site. Okay, that's a wrap. You deserve a breakdown today. <laughs>